As was already mentioned, I'm going to talk about building a functional atlas of all possible mutations in human disease genes. Um, can you, maybe we could tell our, our other guests to go. Arfan, can you mute? Sure, okay. okay. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, we can t uh, just anticipate that the genotype-phenotype problem will be an important bottleneck in a future of precision medicine. Every one of us carries between 200 and 400 missense variants that are so rare that they have likely never before been seen in the clinic. And right now, if a patient were to get sequenced, uh, we would see a lot of what is uh, referred to as BUS, uh, variants of uncertain significance. And the only way we can really make sense of them right now is to either use uh, computational prediction methods like polyphen 2 or Peruvian, or uh, perform manual laboratory assays on them to figure out what they do. Um, the problem with pro uh, computational prediction is that right now it's not uh, not very accurate, and the problem with the laboratory assays is obviously that they're slow and, and expensive. Um, so what if we could instead, uh, instead prepare an atlas of uh, of the, the functional impacts of all possible missense variants before they are even seen in the clinic that are supported with, uh, with laboratory evidence. To do that, we would need an assay that we can scale uh, to, to the appropriate size. And our current favorite for this is uh, functional complementation in yeast. The basic idea is that if we delete a gene in yeast, that usually comes with a, or often comes with a fitness defect. But if we then express the human ortholog of the uh, deleted yeast gene, uh, if we're lucky, the ortholog that is expressed can rescue uh, uh, the phenotype and we see that, uh, that we get uh, high fitness again. Uh, which means that now we have an assay, because now if we introduce different mutations into the human ortholog, we can interpret the decrease in fitness that we see again as a readout of the uh, effect of the mutation on the function of the protein that we're interested in. Um, the problem now is that somehow we have to scale this to, to, the, uh, to the size of mutational space, so uh, somehow cover all possible mutations in a, in, a, in a gene of interest at once. And at this point, I should give a shout out to Doug Fowler and Stan Fields in uh, the University of Washington who pioneered this, uh, this kind of idea, um, which they call deep mutational scanning, which they primarily um, applied to biomedical chemical studies. Um, but we think it has a great um, promise uh, for this kind of application as well. Uh, the idea is that we uh, use a mutagenesis method to generate all possible variants in a gene uh, that, that could possibly exist, bring them all en masse into yeast, and let the yeast cells, this whole pool, a complex pool of yeast cells, grow competitively with, uh, with each other in the presence and absence of selection for, for complementation. And then all we have to do is uh, use sequencing, either uh, barcode sequencing or uh, a um, tile-based deep sequencing approach to figure out how often we see each mutation in the, in the non-selective or selective condition and infer the fitness of each strain in, in this pool. And then uh, we have a uh, computational analysis pipeline in which we uh, primarily do two things. One is to uh, figure out for each measurement that we make that comes out of this pool, how reliable it is. And secondly, to use machine learning in order to uh, uh, boost the completeness and the accuracy of the, of the predictions that we make or of, of the measurements that we make with this assay. And this is uh, the first map that we generated with, with this method, uh, which is for the sumo E2 conjugates UV to I. On the x-axis, I'm showing all possible positions across the protein, all possible amino acid positions, and on the y-axis, all the amino acid residues that could be sitting there if we were to perform that mutation. And then the color in the heat map represents uh, the effect of the mutation. White would be no effect, so it behaves like wild type, blue would be deleterious, and red would be uh, an uh, increase in function over the wild type uh, performance. And on top, I'm showing for reference various different protein-protein interaction interfaces, uh, solvent accessibility in blue here, and uh, well, uh, evolutionary conservation. And uh, while this map is certainly complete, it is a little bit hard to read. So uh, I have a slightly, uh, a, a slightly more intuitive uh, uh, version of this as well. And here I took the structure of the protein of UV2I and mapped 
the median mutant fitness for each of those, uh, for all the mutations that exist in those positions uh, onto, onto the structure. And you can see in general, the map seems to make sense. Uh, we see that the active site is very sensitive to mutation as are 1414 um, interaction interfaces. Uh, but there's also some interesting uh, effects where there are some uh, residues where uh, we often see above wild type fitness. I'm not going to do into too much detail about those, but uh, we can talk about them after if, uh, if someone wants to uh, if someone wants to pursue this. Um, uh, for now, I want to uh, cover uh, the idea that now that we have the technology established, we want to move on and generate more maps for more interesting genes. So I mentioned we uh, uh, we uh, uh, generated the map for DB2I. Uh, the next gene that we uh, went towards is uh, SUMO1, which is actually the substrate of UBE2I in the simulation pathway. Uh, and it's actually a very interesting map because it has some uh, some interesting features. For example, you can see that the first 20 amino acids here are uh, almost insensitive to mutation, which uh, is because the, these first 20 amino acids are actually disordered and also not very strongly conserved. Uh, so that is very well reflected in this map. Similarly, you can see that the last four amino acids are also not very strongly sensitive to mutation, which uh, also goes along with the fact that they are cleaved off right after the expression of the protein. Um, because uh, uh, and there, uh, there's a maturation process, process in which the sumo precursor is turned into the active sumo protein. Um, the next step, uh, proteins that we wanted to look at are, uh, ah, there we go, uh, are some that uh, are uh, more closely associated with disease. Uh, so uh, two genes that we picked out, for example, here are um, NCS1, the neuronal calcium sensor 1, which has a loose association with autism. Uh, they map for TPK1 thiamine pyrophosphokinase, which is associated with a metabolic disorder. And uh, finally, calmodulin, which uh, is associated with uh, different heart, position, uh, uh, heart uh, diseases. Uh, like arrhythmia and uh, a condition called long QT syndrome. And by now we might be wondering how how representative are these maps actually now of, uh, of disease. So we pulled out a couple of examples of known mutations that are either occurring as uh, general polymorphisms in the population or have been pre previously observed in the clinic to be causative of, in this case, long QT syndrome. And you can see if we map the scores that we have on our map, um, and uh, color them according to uh, what was what phenotype was observed with them in the clinic, we can see that uh, our map distinguishes very well between uh, uh, polymorphisms that show up as wild type in our map and uh, pathogenic alleles that show up, uh, up as uh, deleterious. And uh, in fact, in this uh, precision recall curve, you can also see that we uh, perform much better than Pruvian or Colophon 2 in order to uh, uh, make this, this call about uh, deleteriousness. Uh, and yeah, so uh, the next step is well, how far can we actually take this? Well, we have a number of uh, proteins lined up already in the lab that uh, we're going to look into uh, afterwards, uh, but uh, those are still all cases in which we actually have uh, either a implementation assay or at least a hybrid assay that we can plug into our, uh, in, into our methodology. Uh, but you might be wondering how, uh, how far can we actually take this? How many uh, disease genes can we actually cover with this kind of technology? Uh, so right now there's roughly 4,000 uh, known disease genes entered in various different databases. Uh, but uh, for the complementation essay that was talking about, there's now only 5% five of, uh, 5 of these disease genes are, uh, are currently amenable to this kind of assay. Uh, however, there's uh, Roughly 30% that uh, would be uh, that, that have a uh, phenotype, a growth phenotype in human cell lines. So we are currently working on uh, porting this assay, porting this whole technology to be used uh, directly on human cell lines rather than in yeast. And in addition, since we're also collaborating with the Vidal in Boston, who are currently working on a on a big um, reference map of uh, of uh, the human interactome, we also have access uh, on information which of these genes or which of these proteins are engaging in uh, protein-protein interactions that are measurable with yeast or hybrid. And uh, from that we know that another 40% uh, of disease genes are amenable to yeast or hybrid assay. And for overlaps in these numbers, 
uh, right now we already uh, can say that we, our assay would, uh, would be able to work in 57% of disease genes that we know of. And uh, yeah, so the original vision that I presented in my introduction slide may be not as crazy as, uh, as it might originally sound. And with that, I'd like to thank everyone in the Roth Lab, uh, also our collaborators, my uh, committee members, and uh, funding sources, and for the of course. Questions for you? So with the uh, human cell line sort of orthologous sort of system, can you now test controllers? Uh, uh, well, that's a little more tricky, but um, uh, so this is also uh, still in the very early stage. I'm just thinking so, about the other 99% of the genes. Exactly, uh, because <laughs> most mutations wouldn't be really in a coding region. Yeah. Uh, promoters, we're not really thinking about uh, right now. Maybe that's something that we want to look into in the future, but what uh, one post within our lab is currently working on is uh, taking this into intronic sequences, specifically in um, uh, mutation uh, for, uh, for regions that are close to splice sites, so that uh, we can see whether there are any effects on the splicing behavior of different genes. Um, and uh, well, maybe in the future we'll also uh, start looking into promoters, but right now that's not really uh, in the timeline for it. Uh, it's part of our plan. Other questions for Johan? Yes. Um, how intensive it costs? Um, so per gene, maybe about well, if if everything goes well, if we don't run into trouble, maybe four to five months uh, to go through all the steps. And the primary cost, I guess, is uh, 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 salary and time for uh, for people working in the lab. And uh, other than that, uh, the major cost point would be uh, uh, primers for the. Uh, for the mutagenesis method and the actual deep sequencing, uh, which would probably bring us somewhere in, uh, well, just for material, somewhere around five thousand dollars per year. Uh, but that would probably be dwarfed just by uh, the amount of time that technicians spend on it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.